And so Dad turned in his resignation and accepted a call to the Franklin, Pennsylvania church. It was called Congress Hill. Congress Hill Church of God, Franklin, Pennsylvania. He went there in 84. Uh, from, um, I'm sorry. From 86 to 89. So Dad took care of Oak Grove from 82 to 86. From 86 to 89 was Congress Hill. One of the first things he did, and that's, that's clear up by Erie, Pennsylvania. It's right up in the northern reaches of the Western Pennsylvania Conference. And uh, as, as is often the case, um, you go into this little square worship box that you've built and usually set it on a basement. Well, this one was set on a basement, but they didn't put the basement down in the ground very far. And so the, the worship center set up in the air about 12 steps. You had to climb up 10 or 12 pretty nice sized steps to get up into the building. And they made a chair lift that would allow somebody who was not mobile to be able to turn around, set in a chair, and it would lift them up over all those steps and deposit them at the top of the stairway right at the front entrance to the church building. <laughs> and who was the very first one, after that was all completed, who was the very first one to ride up on the chairlift? <laughs> oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you for not making us live with our predictions <laughs> and our false assumptions. When you decide you're going to do something great, you're just going to do it anyway. Congress Hill was an amazing place for mom and dad to serve. They were not only in the, in the community, working with the Methodists, along with all the other ones, but he went out on speaking engagements all over the country. Um, preaching for revivals and different things where he could work it into his schedule. They just had a fantastic time at Congress Hill. And everybody in that part of the conference was just thrilled that they had this dedicated, loving man and his wife and Grandma Wajan <laughs> joining with them to build up the church, to make a major influence for good in their community. Preaching the name of Jesus, living out the life of Jesus, trying to find a way to help and encourage people. It was an amazing time. That three years was a very special time. 86 to 89. 1989, Dad decided to finally retire. He was going to finally put himself out to pasture, but he had no money. He had no money. The house in Indiana was fine, except he had to have an income to survive, he had to do something. He had a nephew, Al Stifler, Albert Stifler. And Albert was a man that just had the Midas touch. About everything he touched turned to gold. He was a very positive businessman. And Al had found a piece of property down in the outskirts of Sarasota that was in litigation. It was um, in an estate. A contractor had bought this 13 acres and he decided he was going to build a honeymoon nest, I guess, 
for his live-in girlfriend, even while he was still living with his wife. And so he went into that acres and he, he built a long, long, long quarter mile, I guess maybe, concrete driveway back to a beautiful two-story house that he had built. And he put his concubine in there and she was unhappy. This beautiful, beautiful home. I mean, gorgeous home. She was lonesome back there. So, what they decided to do is just up a little closer to the road and off to the side of that driveway, they built a second house. This one was a log house. It wasn't you know, a typical log. It was, it's a modern log house. It was a cottage had big open porches all the way around it, lots of breeze, a nice Florida uh, environment, two-car garage and everything in it, and but made out of logs and timbers, all right, great big timbers. And he said, we're going to move your mother in there so she can have the house right next door to the one you're living in, and that'll be, that, that'll make it less lonesome back here in the back end of this long driveway back on this farm. It was like a 10 or 12 stall horse barn on the property and all kinds of things. It was a horse farm. And that was the way they were going to do business. Okay. Until he could figure out how to take care of managing his divorce and all the things that went involved with getting separated. So now he already had somebody set and now he just had to figure out how to get it done. And then he died. He was gone. Well, the lady who had been his mistress thought she owned her house, but he'd never turned any of the paperwork in. The lady he was still married to was automatically owner of the house and all the property. And she said, you can't stay there anymore. You got to move. And so that set up this huge legal battle that lasted for years, I don't know exactly how many years, but it was several years where this property was just in this state of limbo. Who's going to end up with it? The one who was, had all these verbal commitments. This is your house. I'm making this for you. This is your home forever now. But he never turned the paperwork in. He never, never made it legal. And then the wife is trying to get custody and then the divorce is halfway through. It's a real mess. And so the, the price on the property just kept going down because it got more and more dilapidated. Grown up with weeds high enough that you couldn't even see over the top of the weeds. And it was bushes around the house would, had grown up all the way to where they were actually rubbing on the roof two stories up. I mean, in the second story, uh, totally out of control. <laughs> Everything was a mess. Finally, they got enough clarity and enough incentive. Al made him an offer on the whole property, and they took him up was a pretty nice arrangement. Except Al lived in Pennsylvania. He didn't have anybody to look after that property. He didn't have anybody to mow the yard or fix the pump or make sure the irrigation system was working or anything. He just, he was up there a thousand miles away from it. So he made Dad a deal. He said, Uncle Tom, if you'll go down and live in that big house, Move your stuff in from Congress Hill. Move your stuff into that big house. I'll live in the little log cabin when I come down, and you put the property up in good shape. You mow the yard, get things straightened around, and you can live there for free. So Dad went down, looked the property over, thought that was a pretty good deal, and he accepted. 1989. We packed up all of their things, and in two trips, in two weeks, we made 
one caravan from Pennsylvania, Erie, Pennsylvania, all the way to Sarasota, and drove back, loaded up a second caravan truck, and took it down the next week, and they were retired just about Thanksgiving time, 1989. We had Thanksgiving in the carport, Thanksgiving dinner, in the carport um, there in the Sarasota ranch house. And that's what he did for the next two or three years. I forget what it was exactly, but it was, it was a nice span of time. And he took that thing from a ratty, nasty, <laughs> ugly, unkept property and made it look like a golf course. He really knew how to put... It, it was like he said, always, whenever he went to a new church, whenever he went, I'm putting up a sign out by the road under new management. <laughs> oh man, could he... He, with the first trip that we went down there, the first caravan, he was driving his big brown Dodge van, and on the back of that was a trailer with a garden tractor on it and a bunch of all, all kinds of garage stuff all underneath a tarp. And then I followed behind in uh, a Plymouth Volare uh, K car station wagon that belonged to my grandmother. And then Dad had bought a white Pontiac, I think it was a Pontiac, with a red top. It had belonged to his uh, sister. And so Gay drove Mom in that car. I drove in the Volari. Dad was in the uh, Dodge van at the beginning at the front. And we had everything loaded out, maxed completely out. Totally maxed out. Now how can I say that's maxed out? You can't quantify maxed out, can you? <laughs> Only a few minutes after we started out, we uh, had to go up and over a railroad tracks to get out to the main highway. The Valare was carrying so much weight and it had squished the suspension down till there was nothing left. That when we went over the rail track, the muffler was hanging down far enough just below the chassis of the car that the muffler caught on that railroad track, folded up and broke off and was hanging out the back of the car. <laughs> well, no problem. There's a muffler shop right down at the bottom of the ramp off of the, uh, the railroad. So we just pulled in there. He put it up on the rack. He took his torch and he cut off the dangling piece of steel that was still on there with a the muffler. He looked up underneath there and we'd hit the muffler hard enough that the tailpipe had put about a three-quarter inch deep gouge in the front of the gas tank but didn't quite puncture it. <laughs> And he said, okay, now I can fix this for you if you want me to. I can fix it. But um, the next bump in the road is going to tear it off again. My suggestion is just drive it that way. I don't know how far you got to go, but you can't be going all that far. And so, you know, just drive it that way. And when you get it unloaded, take it to a muffler shop and have them put a new muffler on it, new muffler and tailpipe. We didn't tell him we were going all the way to Florida. <laughs> Pennsylvania. <laughs> He'd have had a fit if he'd have known. <laughs> no muffler straight out of the engine. Stunk, carbon monoxide poisoning. You wouldn't ever want to drive a car with the muffler cut off right underneath the front seat. <laughs> Pouring out exhaust fumes into the car. I drove the whole way to Florida with the windows hanging wide open, hoping I wouldn't gag. <laughs> Just driving like crazy. I was in the middle. We had CB radios hooked up between us. And so Dad would say, I gotta move out into the passing lane. And so Gay would pull out into the passing lane and I would 
come out in front of her, and that would clear a pass so that Dad, he couldn't see the trailer. The mirrors weren't good enough to see the trailer, so he would pull the trailer out. Okay, I'm past now. Can I? Am I clear enough to get past the semi or whatever it was? And I'd say, yeah, you're clear. Go ahead. You're all ready. So he'd swing it back over. <laughs> we went back and forth talking on the CB radios all the way to Florida. <laughs> years <laughs> those are experiences we got to Florida just a couple other little stories he had two garden tractors one that he carried down in the trailer and there was another one there I think it was a John Deere he had a wheel horse and a John Deere I think yeah I'm sure it was they were Pretty decent machines. Both of them were pretty decent. He said, okay, Bob, now you get on that one. I think he gave me the John Deere. And he said, I'm going to go out and start mowing out by the road. Out at the end of the driveway down next to the street. And we started mowing down all those weeds. Just inching it forward. Pushing the weeds down underneath the front axles and then letting the more blades chew them all up and just make mush out of all of that junk that it he took a run down through there along that street to get out to where he was going to mow in the front and he was riding in the garden tractor but the weeds in, around him were so high I couldn't see his head as he inched his way through the trash all the way down that driveway and all the weeds that had grown up couldn't even see him sitting in the garden tractor, but I could see all the dust and I could see all the grass clippings being blown everywhere. So I knew he was headed down there and he just had to move forward and let the engine catch up, move forward, let the engine catch up, move forward, let the engine catch up. And we just mowed and mowed and mowed. Pretty soon he was able to get a, a Ford tractor with a bush hog on the back of it. And then he did, he went all over that 13 acres making that thing look like a like a good place. And I would come down every time I got a few days that I didn't have to work too hard. I'd take a vacation, go down there and stay in the sunshine and help my skin clear up in the wintertime. And we'd work on another project on getting that little horse farm straightened out and fully operational, fully operational. And we trimmed up the big old pine trees that had dead limbs hanging out all over everything and had burn piles that were just gigantic. I mean it was two stories high. The burn pile of trash that we had cleaned off, all the branches and trees, everything that had been neglected, piled them up in a great big pile and had two stories high of trees and trash and branches all piled up there in one section of the, the um, <laughs> the property back toward the back. And they told Dad, they said, you're going to have to get a burn permit for that. Because if you have a fire like that, it, you know, it can get away from you. So you have to let the fire department know that you're going to be doing some burning. So he went down to the fire department to get a permit, a burn permit. Burn permit said, now this is good for a fire that's three feet wide. Dad said, I guarantee you, our fire will be three feet wide, or maybe a little more. <laughs> we didn't set the forest on fire. <laughs> But we really worked to keep that thing contained. I mean to tell you, it was trying to burn up the grass and all around us. The heat of that fire was just unbelievable. And that was just the first one. We had a lot of fun. <laughs> we had a lot of fun taking care of that horse ranch down there in Sarasota. And it was down there, Sarasota, during that first time when we were down there mowing all that grass. And I got a call from the state administrator for the Anderson Church of God in Florida, Florida Ministries. And he said, we have a church in Miami, Florida. They lost their pastor. They don't have anybody. And they're stuck. 
could you go down there and fill the pulpit for him some Sunday? I said, yeah, I got one Sunday. I'm going to be down here. I'll go over and preach for him. Now, the, Sarasota is on the Gulf Coast, so Miami is on the other side of the state and then all the way down to the tip of the peninsula. So it was a long ride. But I went down there and I spoke for him. And had a morning worship, pretty standard stuff. And the state administrator, Bill Gerald, said they're ready to start looking for a pastor. But they've never done this very well. I mean, um, they could use some practice. If you don't have something that you need to do on Sunday afternoon before the evening service starts, um, would you let them practice on you? I said, sure, no problem. And so there we had the leaders of the church around these tables. And they said, okay, now we're going to begin this conversation, just pretending that you're a pastoral candidate for this church, North Dade Church of God. I said, okay, now let me just ask you people a couple of questions. What is it that you do best as a church? What's your ministry? Explain to me what, what really moves you, what gets you going. Well, the state administrator, I mean, he is beaming. This is great. This is exactly what they need to struggle through. What is it that you don't do very well? What's your, what's your biggest struggle? How are you going to cope with some of those things? How do you reach people? Tell me about what your ministry plan is. And, oh, Bill Gerald is sitting back there. Oh, this is wonderful. This is exactly what we were hoping. You know, this kind of practice. So we went through that about two hours, something like that, back and forth. So finally it was time. I, I was pretty tired. So I went to the motel and we, we hung out down there at the motel until the evening service came along. Came back and we had the evening service. I was ready to turn around and head for Sarasota again. Bill Gerald said, you really impressed some people here today. You really impacted on them. Would you consider coming down here and being the pastor at Sarasota? I said, yeah, I I would be willing to talk with them about that. And so in a week or two, I think it was like two weeks, we, after I'd gotten back up to Pennsylvania, we came down with my family, Angela and Andrew and Judy and I, the ones that were at home, and we had a conversation with them. Sort of strange conversation. We had the worship services and everything. Then the evening we were going to have a fellowship dinner and um, congregational give and take, question and answer after the dinner. You know, kind of standard stuff. I'd already been there a couple of weeks ahead, so they knew me a little bit, but they didn't know Judy or any of the rest of the family. So we're going to have a question and answer session. Okay. So before I get done with my supper, before I actually got anything digested, for sure, Bill Gerald's came to me and he says, oh, by the way, you're going to have the devotions for the evening get-together, so we need to have you put together a devotional in the next five minutes or so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we talked about forgiveness. Use the story of Zacchaeus. I want you to take me to your house and we're going to spend the day. Today, forgiveness comes to this house. The old tax collector is forgiven, returned back into the rightful place he had in the family of God's Israelite family. Forgiveness. Okay, so that's not a bad little devotional, you know. It's okay, to five minutes notice. Then Bill Gerald's sitting right there at the end of the table, says, you're also going to moderate this meeting. <laughs> okay. I don't, I mean, I've been here now a week or two before, and now today, and now I'm going to moderate this meeting. Okay. I said, okay, let's start. Uh, anybody have any questions? 
and a very nice young lady, very pleasant, came to really appreciate her, stood up over here just to my left, just a little bit, about halfway back in the group of people that were together. And she stood up and she said something so harmless, so seemingly innocent of everything that I took a breath in like I was going to answer something. And Mose Mellon, who was sitting over here on this side, and I learned a bunch of the names already. I mean, I'd already kind of gotten hung out. Mose jumped up and he says, I'm had it with this church. I am absolutely enraged about what, why would you do this to, I'm going to take my family and we're going to leave this church right now after that question. <laughs> and I laughed and I said, now Mose, Mose, she didn't say anything bad at all. Just You're not taking your family anywhere. We're going to work this thing through. We're going to be the family of God here. Just relax. We'll do this. Just, just be patient and listen for a second. Then whatever it was, he sat back down. I answered that, then I answered Moses, and then we... So after the thing was all over, it was very, as you can tell, it's very tense, very, very unsettling. I mean, there's a lot of stress in this congregation. I said, you need a pastor who can help you relearn how to become the family of God. That's all it is. You need someone who can walk with you to the point where you become completely filled as a vessel of the Lord Jesus Christ, unity and love. End of discussion. That's the, way the, that's the next person you set for your next pastor. That's who you want. Okay. They're dismissed. They're heading out. They're picking up their dishes from the potluck. They're going home. Bill Gerald says, I need to talk to you. Over here. Took me into a closed room where they used it for a nursery. He said, where did you learn to put out fires like that? Where did you learn to cope with that kind of powerful emotions like that and not lose control? Well, when you've been a firefighter long enough, you're no longer afraid of the flames. <laughs> and thus began our adventure toward North Dade First Church of God. It took a year for us to get there. It took a, a year of prayer and thought and preparation. And that's a story for another time, but that's how it began. Going down there to Sarasota to help on the ranch, call up, you need a pulpit supply, pastor, can you come down here and just fill the pulpit? All these people need somebody to run the worship service for them. Sure, no problem, got the day. And all of a sudden the Lord goes, whoop, there we go. <laughs> Let's just say I got a 100% vote for the family of uh, the North Day Church to come and be their pastor. But it took a year and another 100% full uni <laughs> unanimous vote a year later before I could actually come. So that's, that's the story of how we got down here and started working with Sarasota and it splattered out over <laughs> the whole southern end of the state. So, all right, that's what we're going to close with now. All right, thank you.